welcome to the Scam Economy with your host, Matt Bender. You better believe it's another edition of Scam Economy. I am your host, Matt Binder, and on today's episode, we are discussing one of my favorite topics in the blockchain space, and that is crypto charity. Longtime listeners might recall earlier this year in one of the first episodes of Scam Economy, I spoke about the different crypto charities that were popping up to raise money for Ukraine. And yes, sometimes people do have the best intentions when trying to raise money via crypto. But I think you'll find that more times than not, the people behind raising these crypto funds have ulterior motives. And in this episode, we focus on a specific charity set up by one of the biggest crypto exchanges there is. But first, to support this show, be sure to go to patreon.com to become a paying subscriber. Your support helps this show grow. Be sure to also go to youtube.com slash mapbinder and follow the YouTube channel for the live premiere of each week's episode. Also, twitch.tv slash mapbinder for the post show. And be sure to connect your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account in order to use your free Twitch Prime subscription every month. You can find all the links to the podcast version of this show at scameconomy.com and be sure to leave a review for Scam Economy at your favorite podcast platforms such as Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And as always, you can follow me on Twitter at Matt Binder, follow Scam Economy on Twitter at Scam Economy. And joining me now to talk about the wonderful world of crypto philanthropy. Leo Schwartz, reporter at Fortune. Leo, welcome back to the show. And you're you're at a new outlet since I last spoke with you. So congrats on the new gig. Thank you so much. Yeah, when I last talked to you, I was at Rest of World. I moved to a job at Fortune magazine. But as you can tell from the coverage, the articles remain the same, which is looking at the global impact of crypto. Right. And I think this is one of the most important uh, beats if I can say so, uh, not to not to flatter you, but uh, it is one of the most important beats right now, especially because, you know, after the crypto crash, I think a lot of people have been thinking about, I don't know, at least here in the United States, you, th- you, you know, if you know, I've spoken about it on this show, people who like, you know, would put their paycheck into crypto and their, 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 their savings into crypto. And again, these people have lost tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. But as far as I've seen, we're not talking about uh, a domino effect that's leaving tons of people in the U.S., Uh, sort of in dire straits or possibly living on the streets. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are pretty screwed, but elsewhere in the world, in developing nations, where they were sold crypto as this sort of savior for their current situation, I feel like, you know, they might not have lost as much as people here in the States, but the amount they lost was a lot more to them to lose. And those folks are are really feeling the pain right now. Definitely. I think you hear a lot about how crypto as a use case can really function a lot more outside the U.S. where there's an established financial system where you don't necessarily need an alternative. But when you look at developing markets, when you look at countries that don't have access to traditional finance, then crypto can become to emerge as something that's useful. And I think to some degree you have seen that become the case in, in different regions. Chainalysis just released their annual global adoption index showing that emerging markets are pushing crypto adoption. But like you said, the flip side to that is often underlooked, especially in US journalism, which is that crypto can have an incredibly negative impact in a lot of developing markets, either if people are putting their money into it as a last resort or as an alternative and losing everything, or in the case of this reporting, where you take philanthropy and you impose cryptocurrency on it, and you introduce crypto into scenarios where it really doesn't make sense. And as I found out in my reporting for this piece, had incredibly negative consequences as well. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to talk about crypto uh, charity. And, you know, if people want to get into I, when you last came on the show, uh, I we talked about people who had lost 
their uh, you know their their they're basically all they had in developing nations when you know Terra Luna crashed and caused the broader crypto crash earlier this year. And then last week I spoke with my guest Domingo Flores about the situation in El Salvador. Uh, but specifically, I'm here to talk about crypto charity with you on this episode. And I've talked about crypto charity before. Um, one of the earliest episodes of the show, I sort of I uh, did my own like solo episode where I just completely went in on these different uh, ideas to raise money for Ukraine uh, back when Russia's war in that country began and how, you know, it was basically you, the most ridiculous thing then was you saw all these uh, founders of new crypto tokens basically adding like Ukrainian politicians saying, Oh, if you accept my cryptocurrency for uh, via your donation link, along with like Bitcoin and Ethereum, Ether, uh, you know, I will personally donate a million dollars to you. And it's like these guys are literally like dangling a carrot on a string, saying, "Oh, I know you're going through wartime right now, but if you help promote my project." Then maybe there's something in it for you too. I was like, just like, oh my god, so like disgusting, honestly. Uh, so I, you know, I have a, a very negative view of crypto charities because at the end of the day, I really do think that every single one I've seen does have some sort of self promotion angle, even if it's coming from someone with the best intentions. At the end of the day. There is no reason to uh, give some sort of donation to people in need of charity, people who are, you know, in poverty. There's no reason to give them crypto unless you're trying to promote either your crypto exchange or your crypto specific crypto token or your whatever Web3 project you're working on. There's, there's, they, they can't do anything with it. They need the currency that's widely accepted in their country, whatever country that may be. Yeah, I think you can really break crypto-based philanthropy into two camps, one of which is using crypto as a vector for fundraising. So there's one company I talked to for this article called The Giving Block, which helps traditional nonprofits fundraise using crypto, but at the end of the day, the off-ramp is fiat. I think that arguably can be good because maybe it can open new donor pools for, say, young crypto bros who want to donate money to the Red Cross or something like that. The other type is what you're talking about, which is when the distribution is actually happening in cryptocurrency or you're using NFTs or something as the actual fundraising vehicle. And in this case, when you're doing direct giving campaigns with cryptocurrency, then, yeah, I think a lot of people I talked to, a lot of experts said, you have to look at the main intent of those campaigns being promotion. And I spoke to one fantastic ac academic from the UK who studies development, who pointed to the, early, the earliest days of Bitcoin, when one of the first times Bitcoin really entered the mainstream was this debate over whether Bitcoin should be used to fundraise for WikiLeaks, which at the time was under a lot of pressure and couldn't necessarily raise money in traditional ways. And a lot of people in the Bitcoin community who are coming from this more libertarian background said, if we raise money for WikiLeaks using Bitcoin, it will raise our profile. And that was actually one of the last posts from Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonymous founder of Bitcoin, who said, we're not ready for this. It's going to bring a lot of pressure that arguably increased the profile even more, especially in a few months when Julian Assange did begin accepting payments in Bitcoin. But you can look to those early days and say philanthropy and cryptocurrency are completely intertwined and it's often used as promotion. Uh, in this case, what I was looking at was the biggest exchanges like Binance or Coinbase who have philanthropic initiatives. And again, what a lot of the experts I spoke to said is when you're doing charity initiatives, especially in the developing world, and when you're distributing capital in cryptocurrency, the use case there is increased adoption. And in this specific case I looked at, which was of Coinbase, you even have Brian Armstrong the founder saying that in his initial post saying we need to spur crypto economies and the way that we're going to do that is by basically seeding cryptocurrency into them. So exactly like you said, the, the intent there is, is likely promotion.
Right, right. And I love the idea of, you know, Satoshi basically trying to deter WikiLeaks from using Bitcoin early on. I mean, if there ever was a perfect sort of use case for exactly what Satoshi had envisioned, I mean, reading his, you know, the white paper and and knowing the ideological bent of the earliest Bitcoiners and still a lot of those Bitcoin maxis still hold those right wing libertarian leaning beliefs. Um, it's sort of funny that he would, you know, go, don't use it though. You know, it's for this very purpose, but don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. I think he was worried about the heat that would come. It was at the time when it was still slowly creeping toward adoption. It was really only restricted to these more niche internet forums. And he said, we don't, we don't have enough traction or enough of a foothold to be able to weather the inevitable regulatory firestorm that's going to come if we get involved with WikiLeaks. Uh, he was probably right in that regard, at least with the timing, uh, especially when you see what's what's happening with crypto now uh, in terms of policy. But yeah, it's a, it's a pretty interesting anecdote from the early days. Right, right. So let's let's jump into this. Well, first of all, you, you said you looked into Binance as well, and I know you don't mention them in, in your piece. Um, but but can you uh, say a few words about their their philanthropic efforts? I think it's pretty traditional for most major corporations to have some sort of philanthropic offshoots. Um, like you said, this piece mostly focuses on Coinbase, so I didn't look into Binance that much. But it's a lot of the same, which is different initiatives that either fundraise money in cryptocurrency or actually distribute cryptocurrency uh, as a way to, I think make their own image look better as a way to promote cryptocurrency, however you want to look at it. Um, with Coinbase, though, specifically, it was this direct giving initiative they started called Give Crypto, where the idea would be they would both raise money in cryptocurrency and then distribute money to people they viewed as in need in developing countries, focusing mostly on, on Latin America and Africa. Right. So let's, let's get into this. Um, let's get into your piece which everyone should go check out at fortune.com, how Coinbase's $1 billion crypto philanthropy, oh my God, I'm going to mangle that word throughout. It's one of those words, you know what I mean? Uh, and Luckily, Richard, I just had to write it. I didn't have to say it. <laughs> right, right. Uh, 1 billion crypto philanthropy ambitions left a trail of disappointment and workers in the lurch. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this organization called Give Crypto. Now, did it start out as uh, an offshoot of Coinbase? I was a little bit, uh, I feel like it was always connected, but they didn't sort of um, really embrace it until later on. Yeah, this was one of my questions I was trying to answer throughout the piece. You can look back through the public announcements, basically from Coinbase and Give, Give Crypto's blog to figure out the timeline, which is in early 2018, Brian Armstrong, who's the founder of Coinbase, said, I want to get more into philanthropy. He wrote a Medium post on Coinbase's blog. His Medium posts are, are pretty famous. It's the main way that he communicates with the public. Uh, and a few months later, he decided the best way to get into philanthropy would be starting this initiative called Give Crypto. It should be a separate non nonprofit, a separate organization that basically would raise money. Uh, initially, a good amount of the money was from himself, also from other prominent crypto figures, uh, and they would distribute that cryptocurrency around the world in emerging markets. It wasn't really clear yet how they would do it. He said it would happen through local, quote unquote, ambassadors who would basically find people in need, give them the cryptocurrency that had been donated, and then either they would transfer into fiat currency or in Brian Armstrong's wildest dreams, it would actually spur these crypto economies and basically kick off a self-sustaining economy. Sort of like what you saw with um, Bitcoin Beach in El Salvador. Uh, I think a dream of a lot of crypto enthusiasts, especially in the US, is that they can create actual circular economies using crypto, often done through charity or film, phil philanthropy. It's a tough word. Yes. <laughs> or, or direct giving. It's shocking um, how difficult yeah. that word is to say within conversation, right? <laughs> but you know, here here's the th interesting thing about about you know uh, that idea. I mean, because you know which one they want, right? Like it's very clear which one they want. Like they can't say you need to use this 
you know, crypto to crypto or, you know, cri- you know, pay people in crypto because then word gets out and it's going to make them look bad that, you know, people who have nothing do have money in their, uh, you know, crypto wallet, but they're not allowed to exchange it for money they actually could use. That would look bad. But we know that's really what they want. They don't want them to exchange it for the local fiat currency because then that money is just removed. Um, they don't get anything out of that when that happens. Yeah, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. And it's tough because you do need some sort of chicken and egg scenario, some sort of traction to be able to actually spur that sicker economy. But as they quickly found out, especially if you're partnering with local ambassadors who just turned out to be random people that they found often through programs like Upwork, they would send the ether to those people, the ambassadors. The ambassadors would find people in their community who needed the money and they'd be like, look, I have $100 worth of ETH. What's someone in the Democratic Republic of the Congo going to do with that? They can't go spend that at a market. So then you have to figure out a way to transfer the ETH into the currency. That's going to have an entire transfer fee that, transfer fee that comes with it. It takes time and it doesn't really make sense. Um, but when the crypto first started, uh, again in 2018, Brian Armstrong announced his goal was to raise a $1 billion fund in two years. And that's what initially caught my attention. So in 2018, when he started the initiative and basically hired a director and created it as its own nonprofit, he said, this will be a $1 billion fund in two years, or at least that was the goal. Now, I got to say, uh, that does sound like a lot to people like you and me, but also knowing how much money was flying around in crypto. I mean, still, I mean, we could pretend the crypto crash has affected this. Yeah, it's affected the the average Joe who put, uh, you know, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand dollars in. But the people who actually were making a lot of money in crypto all along, their wallets may have been take may have taken a hit, but they're not they're not they're not struggling. So they all still have a lot of money and there's certainly uh, two years, a billion dollars in crypto. If they really wanted to get this done, they could have got a billion dollars in this fund. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, usually I like, you know, the, the, the big reveal, but I feel like we have to give this away up top. Uh, so now what did they give crypto start again? 2018. And they wanted a billion in two years in this fund, right? Uh, Coinbase. Yes. What did you find in terms of whether that that dream came to fruition? So I spoke with six of the local ambassadors for this piece who were in Chad, the DRC in Venezuela. I was able to get anecdotal information from them. Often they were distributing somewhere in the magnitude of one thousand or two thousand dollars in the last of give crypto's blog post from twenty twenty one. They were talking about how they were distributing money in the magnitude of thirty thousand dollars, so obviously far less than the billion dollars that Coinbase initially said. I did end up getting confirmation from Coinbase at the very end of the reporting process because Give Crypto went dark in 2021. They stopped publishing any public information. I've heard varying reports from different people I spoke to for the article. Some of them said it's no longer an operation. Some of them said, seemed to think that it was still an operation. But when an official Coinbase spokesperson reached out, they said that Coinbase had distributed around a million dollars in 2022, uh, which is not zero. So it seems to imply that it's still happening, but is obviously far short of one billion dollars. Uh, it's very short. And I would I would assume now I don't quote me on this because I don't run expert on corporate philanthropy. But uh, I'm assuming Coinbase, a, a, a company traded on the stock market, it makes a lot of money or is worth a lot of money. Million seems kind of low for a philanthropic effort. <laughs> I would say I, I can't necessarily comment on that, but your your instinct seems to be in the right direction. Right. Um, right. <laughs> I mean, it seems it seems weird. Like, I don't know. I'm thinking of a, of a random. I'm tr- trying to think of a random uh, company. Uh, uh how much does how much does McDonald's give away via charity? Um, in total, McDonald's donated uh, via its franchises and customers 
I'm guessing when they, you know, do you want to give a dollar chat to charity when you know with your order or something like that? Donated over a hundred and sixty-eight million dollars via the Ronald McDonald House uh, in 2021. So, I mean, million seems kind of long. <laughs> And what I can't, so what I tried to do in this reporting process, because for its few first years, and you have to give, give, give crypto credit for this, they did have a lot of public accounting. They had an active blog and they would post every month. They would break down what they were doing with the initiative. And it was on a small scale, but obviously it was brand new. I think aside from Brian Armstrong's first assertion that it would be worth a billion dollars, it makes sense that a project at this scale will be tough to pull off at least for the first few years. Um, but in 2021, Coinbase made an announcement that they were officially bringing Give Crypto back within Coinbase. I found records um, that Give Crypto had incorporated in Delaware as an exempt organization. And normally what nonprofits have to do is file what's called a 990 in which they include all of their accounting records. I wasn't able to find one of those. So ideally Coinbase should be publishing with transparency all the information about their philanthropic initiatives. It turned out with Give Crypto, they haven't. So it could be the case, maybe they're donating other money to charity, maybe they aren't. Uh, but this initiative, Give Crypto, which initially was supposed to be this billion dollar fund and was supposed to be the philanthropic arm of Coinbase, sort of disappeared into the background, at least until this article came out. Right, right. And, and I just want to, because I know people are going to be looking up how much revenue McDonald's makes compared to Coinbase, because people think McDonald's big, large, huge, mega conglomerate global. McDonald's makes roughly a little bit over three times uh, the amount uh, that uh, Coinbase made in 2021. Coinbase's uh, revenue for 2021, $7.8 billion, which... That's pretty crazy. And then McDonald's revenue in 2021, 23 billion. So if you were to, you know, times that amount, then the equivalent would be if McDonald's uh, raised $3 million for charity. Uh, but again, that's not the case. And now I'm not trying to make McDonald's sound great. McDonald's is, you know, terrible in other ways. But to compare, large mega corporations generating billions and billions of dollars in revenue, Coinbase's philanthropic efforts seem to be lacking. And that's on top of the idea that um, this is all just to help anyway, because as we're going to get into a little bit more now with the individual you spoke with, um, you know, the whole, the whole give crypto um, scheme, which, um, you know, we don't really know much more, like you mentioned, because there are filings that still are out there or should be out there that are, are not discoverable um, because they probably don't exist. Um, there's, yeah, first of all, the first thing that really, you know, sort of hit me when reading your piece, and you should get into his story now, was the, the uh, Christian Maloba from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I mean... They basically took advantage of this guy. Yeah, for me, I think the hardest part of this story isn't necessarily that Coinbase isn't donating a ton of money. I, I'm not going to argue on the, the merits of what the philanthropic responsibilities for mega corporations should be, or even that they fell very, very short of that initial $1 billion goal. Obviously, Silicon Valley founders set ridiculous goals all the time and don't meet them. I think the real problem with this is what we were talking about at the beginning, which is the feasibility of crypto-based initiatives and the kind of hubris that companies go into when they say, we want to reinvent the wheel with philanthropy. We're going to create economies around crypto in places like the DRC or in Chad or in Venezuela. And what they end up doing is a good amount of local harm. So again, as I mentioned, uh, their model was basically to work with local ambassadors who would people who are people they would find on the ground in these countries and frame them either as volunteers or pay people making very little money and have them be the ones basically doing all the work. So in this case, this man, Christian Maloba, who lives in the DRC, was looking for a job on Upwork when the director of Give Crypto reached out to him and said, do you want this job? It's a little strange. Basically, I need you to find people in your community, help them get set up with crypto wallets, 
send them ETH, figure out how to help them exchange that into currency, and then basically document with photos and videos how they're using the funds. And Christian needed a job. Uh, he was interested in crypto and he said, sure, I'll do this. And then for the next months, he was basically strung along by Give Crypto. Initially, he was paid $30 to find 10 people in his community and help get them set up with crypto wallets, receive ETH and spend it and take videos and photos of them using the money and send it back to Give Crypto so Give Crypto could put it on their site and fundraise more money ostensibly. Um, but after that, Christian kept doing work for Give Crypto and didn't receive any more money from them. Um, he ended up distributing money to 10 more people. And then when Coinbase officially came on board again, marketing people reached out to him, had him take even more photos, more videos, had him write up official proposals, said that they were going to send a video crew to like do a documentary about the impact crypto is having in his community. Throughout this entire time, Christian was not getting paid any money from Give Crypto for his work, even though the director at one point said, there might be opportunities in the future for you to make money. And whenever he would do this work, such as sending the money to 10 more people or writing up these pretty intricate proposals about how he could help, for example, build a new school in the community using crypto, every time he would send this information to them, they wouldn't respond. And then eventually, just last January, he asked them for the last time, what's happening? Is this still going on? And the director, who it was no longer give crypto just responded, sorry, the project's done. Um, and I think that's really the lesson here, which is that you have these corporations going in, maybe with good intentions. They say, you know, we want to change the world with crypto. They just don't really understand the impact that their actions necessarily have in these often fragile local economies. Right. You know, I read when I was reading the piece, I, I, I'm, I took another look when you were while you were talking right now, because I don't know why. It's not this way in the piece. That's why I wanted to double check. But I honestly, in my mind, read it when I was reading about you know the the um, financial arrangement between uh, that that young man Maloba in the the Democratic Republic of Congo and what you know Coinbase set him up with in terms of the gig. I read it in my head as okay, they're going to give him thirty dollars for each recipient that he finds. Because I guess that just made more sense. Like, it still seemed low to me. But, you know, sort of like a commission for each person, I guess. But that's not the case. <laughs> it was $30 flat to find 10 people to give this $100 each of Ether to via the Give Crypto program. Yeah. And then another 10 people for which you receive no money. And then he wrote up two proposals later on after meeting with the Coinbase marketing people. And he was finding, editing, and translating all of these videos and also photos of the people on how to use their funds, which is what Give Crypto told him to do. I spoke with other people in Venezuela, one of which worked 40 hours a week at one point for Give Crypto and was getting paid around $400 and then got a raise to $600. Someone else was only getting a small percentage of the transaction fees. $600 a month? $600 a month, Jeez. yeah. And then he was relying on that as his primary source of income. And when the pandemic hit, Give Crypto exited the country without telling him, and he lost his primary source of income without any word from Give Crypto, any updates on what was happening. I mean, this obviously isn't the, the biggest takeaway here, but it seems like the least that they could have done is just communicate these people who were depending on them for the scraps they were paying them to begin with. Like what, what would have been so hard to just say, Hey, we're gonna, you know, this is going to be winding down in the next week or two, even like weird. I think the issue is when you take this Silicon Valley move fast and break things ethos and you apply yes. it to philanthropy, there's a lot of issues with philanthropy, obviously, but at the same time, I think if you look at, good nonprofits and foundations, they do real impact assessments and tread very carefully with figuring out what type of impact their work will have. In this case, Coinbase was like, we can do this on our own. They hired a director who had no experience in philanthropy. They went into developing countries, emerging markets, didn't really think about what consequences their actions were, would have and, and didn't really seem to approach it deliberately uh, or with much transparency. And again, I, th I think you can say, even if one of the main motivations was promotion, their intention still 
may have been good when it came to like, we think that we can take a lot of the riches that we have and distribute it with cryptocurrency, which we genuinely think will save a lot of these economies, but they just did it in uh, what seems like a very irresponsible manner. Did, did they get paid in crypto, the ambassadors? Yes. The <laughs> wow. Christian didn't. The ones in Venezuela did. Christian got paid through Upwork, which was the platform that he was hired on, which ah. is like a free Weird that they, you know, that would have, that to me is very bizarre. Like on top, I mean, obviously this whole thing is, is, is sort of messed up in, in many different aspects, but in, in Christian's case, um, the young man from, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, he was offering translation services on Upwork, which is like a, a sort of like a gig website where you post like, you know, the, the type of job you can, jobs you can do, and then you sort of bid for uh, job requests that people are looking to hire for. Um, and they reached out to him to do this via his translation service uh, offering. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, I, I think, I, something, something is real, that stuck out to me as something being very weird. I mean, I wouldn't trust if I was offering like a, a service on like Fiverr or Upwork or Freelancer or whatever, uh, the, you know, list those sites all you want uh, down the line. I would automatically have red flags for, I mean, I would straight up turn it down if someone came to me looking for a service that had nothing to do with what I was offering. Yeah. I mean, uh, I have a funny quote in the piece, which is I asked him if it was strange. He was like, yeah, I definitely thought it was a scam immediately. But I think they found a lot of people, in this case, it was by accident, who were interested in crypto or associated with crypto in some way, especially in Venezuela, where crypto adoption is pretty huge because of the financial system being cut off from a lot of global access. Um, but in this case, he thought it was a scam, but he was like, I'm a student in the DRC taking online classes at BYU, Idaho. Like not a ton of people are in my inbox offering me jobs. I, I might as well take this one. Do, do you get the, the, uh, the, the feeling here? And again, this is, uh, you know, I understand if you can't say anything uh, further, but I feel like they went this route because they didn't want to publicize that they were searching. Like if they had put this like open call or a hiring thing or any any sort of uh, announcement out there on the internet, even if they didn't use the Coinbase name, like give crypto looking to hire ambassadors all around the world, reporters would eventually come across it, dig a little and see what's going on here. If you reach out directly to randos based on just where they say they are based, you don't have to worry about that. I think it was more that they understand there's a huge amount of fraud that happens in this industry and also just with international money distribution. And they, I think it goes back to the previous theme. It's not necessarily bad intentions or malice. It's just not really having the intentionality to do this well. They didn't have these networks established. So they were like, where can I find a facsimile of a trust network. I can do it on Upwork. These people have ratings. <laughs> so I can find oh, someone right. who has like good ratings <laughs> that I don't have to verify myself. And uh, and then if they don't do well, then you know it's easy to cut off. I think in Venezuela, some of the ones that some of the ambassadors I talked to had gotten a job through a friend, which is basically another trust network, which is a recommendation. So my understanding is that was the main motivation for going through a platform like Upwork is they could verify it was an actual person as opposed to just posting on Twitter, asking for people, and then they would probably get bots, you know, right. trying to get through. Right. That's, I, I didn't even think of the, uh, the rating system they have on there. What better way to make sure that you'll have people who deliver, right? Um, how did they find the, the folks in Venezuela if it wasn't through Upwork or one of those platforms? My understanding is that it was through friend and professional networks. I think the initial ones, the initial people they found, I think some were through universities, some may have been through professional networks, but then it, it went out from there. So some of the ones I had talked to basically got into it from referrals from people they knew who were also working on the project. Got it. Got it. So this all 
sort of peters out. But when it was going on, when Give Crypto was actually so in in Christian's case, it seems like he gave what twenty people or was it more? At least twenty people, a hundred dollars in ether each as part of the Give Crypto program. Yes, and my understanding and what I've heard from some sources is that the country that it had the biggest footprint when it was in, was in Venezuela, where it was operating more in the magnitude of thousands of people. Uh, and one ambassador has told me it's still operating today that he's continuing to work with 10 people. Um, but in places like the DRC and Chad, where I spoke with other ambassadors, it was happening on a much smaller scale. When you say working with, this, it's, it's, it seems like seems like this is a thing where you sort of like you find someone who you feel like could benefit from, you know, I'm guessing, you know, all these ambassadors look for folks in their uh, hometowns who can really use the hundred bucks um, and they approach them. They sort of walk them through setting up the wallet, uh, getting the crypto, choosing what to do with it, exchanging it, filming the video about how this changed or helped them. Um, and then that's it, right? Like it does, it's not really an ongoing process, is it? No, I mean, it, it was pretty transactional and, and one off in that nature, which again is, I, I think a lot of good nonprofits or philanthropic initiatives will understand impacts and trying to assess what it means to do one off donations versus doing something more sustainable. Uh, in this case, there was more of an extractive element, I think. It's funny because I, I asked Christian to share some of the photos that he had sent to give crypto. And I went to the photo editor at, at Fortune and she was like, you know, I, I think there's some ethical issues here in publishing these because a lot of them were of kids or of people who didn't necessarily know where the photos and videos were going. But obviously in give crypto's case, they didn't really think about that. They're like, Christian, you have to go find people in need, but make sure you take photos and videos of them using the crypto in whatever way, you know, buying books or in one case, like building health facilities or paying for your sick kid, make sure that you get photo and video evidence of that. And then we're going to put it on our website. And I don't think there was really an ethical consideration of, of what that really meant, uh, which was another part that that sort of sat with me wrong. Right, right. That's, that's, you know, I guess, par for the course in this world, isn't it? Um, but to be fair, to be fair, uh, you know, I want to be fair. It, it does seem like uh, the recipients of this essentially free money uh, did seem like all, you know, it didn't seem like this was being like, you know, funneled through uh, different fake names to like a, a, a one guy or network that was like taking advantage of the system and walking away with like all $50,000 or whatever. Seems like the people actually were in need of money and they got a free 100 Ether and after they exchanged it, exchanged it, I don't know, a couple, you know, 10, 20 bucks in fees maybe. Um, you know, they had money that they used for food, rent, things of that nature. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And again, I think you can't discount that maybe when done in a more sustainable manner, these programs can be good. I speak with a lot of people who are working on international programs when it comes to crypto, and you hear about how inefficient a lot of these global networks currently are, where in some cases, development organizations are literally sending pallets of actual cash. <laughs> and that doesn't make sense. And crypto, I think, does offer means of being able to transfer money, especially globally, in a more efficient way. And I, I do think it's good for different applications like that to be explored. Um, and in this case, it, it certainly uh, could have had or did have good one-off purposes where people were able to use this money and help their sick kid or, or build health facilities. Um, but I don't think Give Crypto ever really considered what the broader impact would be. And in Christian's case, I have some quotes from him where he said, you know, he alternately felt like an angel and a judge. And I think it was tough for him where he lived in this community and he was going out and giving money to people. And he told them not to share that they were getting money, but of course they did share with other people. And then he just had a bunch of people coming to him being like, I need money. Uh, and, and that's a, a difficult situation to be in, especially because he's not a professional development worker. 
Right, right. You know, I, 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 I was fair, but I do have to add the addendum that, like, while this obviously did help, you know, if, if there wasn't that, um, that benefit for Coinbase where they felt that there could be a good trade off of people who stayed in crypto, they would have never gotten involved with this program to begin with. Because, again, as we were discussing, like, if you really just wanted to help, you would just send them the local currency. Yeah. I mean, everyone I spoke with, including people who work professionally within crypto philanthropy and different, different means, I think they'll all say two things. One of which is crypto is currently locked in a PR battle, which is on one hand, the public hears about how everyone's losing all their money in crypto and there's all of these scams and it's awful. And there are people who are in crypto and, good faith or however you want to describe it, who say like, we need to have a better image for cryptocurrency and maybe philanthropy is one of the ways in it. Then the other side of that is like you said, it's not just good PR for crypto. It's we need more adoption. We need more users. The best place to get users is to look outside the US probably to look at developing markets and what better way to spur local economy, local crypto economies than actually seeding crypto through these types of but, but, you know, I, the more I think about it, like, the more, like, sort of devious it seems to me. Like, you know, even when I try to think, like, of, like, those individuals who Christian gave the money to and how, um, although there was that one quote that stuck with me where it was, like, Christian uh, chose, like, a, a doctor who was able to buy supplies that she needed for her, you know, her, her medical practice, and she needed more and like came back hoping that the, you know, the, the fund would give her more, not realizing that no, like the purpose isn't really to help your, your, <laughs> you take care of people there, honestly, sadly enough, you know, that, that one really sort of struck with me, um, stuck with me, I should say. Um, but the more I think about it, the more sort of like devious it is that like they've run out of people in the U.S., and there's no way to read that other than like, th there's no more people who uh, can be suckered into this for now at least because things went awry. I mean, again, this wasn't uh, this was in 2018 to 2021, but you know, crypto had its ebbs and flows then. I believe uh, that that um, you know, crypto had a crash back in 2018 as well. Um, so they go to developing nations where again, like. Maybe these people are more open to it because they're sort of a little bit more desperate. But that also means like they don't have this disposable income to to frankly put fuck around with. Like you can't like you said before perfectly, you can't like unravel or like uh, you can't go with the Silicon Valley, you know, you know, go run fast and break stuff model uh with when people's lives like this are in the balance yeah i mean i i think and i quote this professor of development who says exactly what you said which is you know they're always looking for new suckers <laughs> this is this is one way to do it but i think if you speak and i have with people at these companies or uh who are working in crypto-based philanthropy they say in their mind, crypto is the best way to bring financial inclusion to a lot of develop, developing countries or developing markets that have been otherwise shut off from international banking solutions. What do they say when they, uh, I mean, you didn't ask them this, or maybe you did, but uh, this is a question to ask them. How do you um, counter the fact that if that's the case, why do all these individuals immediately transfer it into the local currency like i mean the actions speak louder than the words i mean you can say till the cows come home that uh this is the best means for these people but we are seeing and you know give crypto is one of many many examples where the vast majority of the people who receive crypto say uh i need my local money asap and they 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 exchange it for that yeah, well, this is the perpetual refrain in crypto, which is <laughs> early days. It's early days. We're building. We're building it. Right. When, when was the, uh, when was Satoshi warning uh, WikiLeaks not to use uh, Bitcoin again? 
I believe it was 2010. I think it was the end of 2010. Early yeah. days, Leo, right? Early days. Yeah. <laughs> I won't I won't comment. <laughs> I mean, I listen, I I you know, I I I think that you should not use charitable efforts in exchange of advertising or promoting your 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 company. I, I always felt that was in bad taste. I mean, it's a little bit different when a company is like every percentage of the sale will go to this charity. I still think, you know, there's better ways to go about it. But at least then, like, people, are, they're basically just taking money out of their own revenue and and giving it to the charity. It's not like the product itself is the charitable uh, donation. Um so whenever I see, I mean, this was, this was the case back in the summer of 2021 where all these uh, fly-by-night tokens were popping up, a lot of them from like social media influencers, and every single one of them, in order to advertise the token, would say, oh, there is a charitable element to this. You're going to make money, and guess what? You're going to feel great because... Uh, part of this money is going to go to uh, uh, dogs with cancer or part of this money is going to be going to uh, hungry children. I mean, the, uh, the, um, the big uh, scandal last summer when it came to crypto was a, f a few of the members of that uh, huge esports brand, uh, FaZe Clan, they had started a crypto token literally called Save the Kids. And the purpose of it was, oh, get in early. You're going to make some money. And on top of that, every time someone sells their tokens, trades their tokens, a percentage of that, uh, that amount goes towards charities to save the kids. I don't even think they got specific, if I recall. We're just, we're just saving the kids. You got you know, to save the kids. Yeah, you got to save. save the kids. Yeah. And then they pumped and dumped right away. And Face Clan had to go about uh, a real like uh, PR campaign to try to clean up their image, and uh, they had to release some of these guys from the team, um, and it was a whole mess. And it's like, you know, to me, like if your product is the charity, or if first of all any sort of investment that's giving a charitable. Um, uh, 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 sort of uh, element to it. It makes zero sense because if your purpose in investing in a speculative asset is to make money, where the fuck is the where the fuck is the donations for the charity coming from? Where do you think that's coming from? You that's coming from your money. Like it's not coming out of thin air. That's your investment money they're giving away. Yeah. Well, the most famous one, right, is Worldcoin which is probably my favorite company that I still don't really, I feel like I've read so many articles about it. I still don't really grasp it, but basically it's this Sam Altman backed founded company where they go around with a metal orb that scans people's irises in developing countries and in exchange they get their identity scanned and they get some sort of token. And I think it, it's this combination identity database and UBI seeder and weird dystopian metal orb, <laughs> which only 10 exist. And it's a venture back company. I feel like it, it sort of encompasses this entire world. And it's whenever an article pops up about it, I click within a microsecond because it's probably my favorite story. But yeah, I think, I think that's probably the, the, the best example of this. Wait, so hold on. I, I, I've heard of WorldCoin before, but I honestly have not looked too much into it. And it seems like you're giving me great fodder for a future Scam Economy episode. Uh, Please do a three-hour look into WorldCoin and I will <laughs> listen to you. So we, we don't know. It's never been said or uh, covered what the purpose of this eyeball scanning is for. Yeah, the purpose... Uh, Sam Altman is really big into UBI. And I, I think the general idea of it is both to be able to create some sort of decentralized digital identity and be able to seed a UBI program and to no, do but, it specifically in, in developing economies. No, but what is this, 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 what is this, what is the purpose of the data that they're collecting? Like, is it, I what, think it's to be able to create this database that they can distribute UBI through. So oh, it's just for, 
opportunities to do that, but it happens through this very strange dystopian large metal orb. Very weird. Yeah. Very weird. I remember issues with the orb and you know, there's only a few of them and they're very expensive. It's a, it's a whole thing. Please. This please isn't, this isn't, um, this isn't to, uh, crypto related, but a few years ago for a piece, I had my body scanned by Amazon for a uh, in exchange for a gift card um but the purpose it. of it apparently was for their like i don't even know if they ever even rolled it out yet but they wanted to like allow people to try on clothes via the app or whatever so they would need to scan all these different body types so they would i guess figure out how to i don't know but it was a experience i wrote a a, a piece on it a few a few years ago um, but very weird, very weird. Whether yeah, you're doing we, it for gift cards or crypto, uh, very weird to have your your physical presence captured by technology. <laughs> yeah, you're really putting your body on the line for journalism, and I respect that. I don't know if I would have done that. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was uh, it was funny because um, uh, you know I had to take my shirt off for my job. It was bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> no HR approval beforehand. All right, yeah. Uh, luckily, it was just me and uh, the Amazon body scanner. Otherwise, maybe it would have been uh, <laughs> would have been an issue. Uh, but so, so what? What ended up happening with Give Crypto? It's it's sort of from the piece. It seems like I know you said that they closed up shop with a lot of these um, ambassadors, but some of these ambassadorship ambassadorships are still ongoing. What 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 became of Give Crypto? Yes, yeah, so the timeline is around April 2021. Give Crypto or Coinbase mutually announced that they were formally going to become united. Give Crypto would be wrapped into Coinbase as a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, a few months later, Joe Waltman, who was the director, publishes his final post on the public medium of Give Crypto, but doesn't phrase it that way. Basically, says you know. It's the beginning of the next phase. We're very excited about what's going to hap happen now that we're part of Coinbase. And then after that, it just goes radio silent. There's no public mention of it. There's no records, as I mentioned. I did searches in different databases and of 990s, and I couldn't find anything. Um, and that's when I ultimately got confirmation from Coinbase that it was still operational, but on this very small scale. Um, but I, I think it's clear from the outside and from speaking with ambassadors and other people familiar with Give Crypto that they basically significantly scaled down the operations, scaled down the ambitions and, and realized it wasn't really working. Right. So, I mean, listen, like we mentioned earlier, um, you know, none of these corporations or companies have any obligation to do anything for charity, really. I mean, this is all just voluntary from them to decide to do these things. Um, again, don't want to make uh, uh, Mickey D's out to sound like the good guy with <laughs> my example from earlier. But I did want to sort of give this, uh, you know, uh, because, you know, so many times we hear, and we hear this a lot from even like politicians, like the opportunity out there from uh with the, with that crypto brings and that's why we need to like you know not stifle this like technology and these these entrepreneurs trying things out and you know we also hear that like all of these young millionaires and in some cases maybe even billionaires have sprung out of this new crypto economy and then obviously all these you know all this money will go into various endeavors to help people whether it be uh, for charity or not. But I mean, here we are. And one of the biggest success stories of crypto Coinbase, uh, decided to get into the dip their toe in the phil philanthropy world and really blew it every way, shape and turn. They didn't even, they didn't even just throw a bunch of money at it and say, Hey, look, we gave out all this money. Like they didn't even, they didn't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i i do like you said i i think there are potential applications i i have talked with some projects that i think are doing interesting work i'm hoping to continue doing more reporting on this specific field um but it's interesting 
one of the companies I talked to is called Giving Block, which, as I mentioned in the beginning, does this other form of crypto philanthropy where they're not necessarily donating money or distributing money in crypto. They're basically helping more traditional nonprofits and foundations raise money in crypto and open up the donor pool, which seems to be finding su success. And they've raised tens of millions of dollars through this means. And what the founder of that company told me is the real issue is that when you have these crypto companies coming to the space with a lot of hubris and what he said is they want to reinvent the wheel. They want to create their own initiative. They want to make their own nonprofit. And he says, no, like there's already foundations out there, like actual foundation or foundations. Like non-crypto um, foundations that focus on the actual uh, humanitarian effort and not, you know, uh, you know, growing their bag. Yeah. Like arguably if Coinbase had said, we're going to rally all of our resources and network and just raise a bunch of money and give it to the Red Cross or something that that could have been a lot more efficient. Um, but it will be interesting to see how this continues to evolve as the industry likely grows. You're going to probably have a lot of these NFT scam projects. I mean, I, I think a lot of people argue that overall what's happened in Ukraine has been a success where they've been able to raise a huge amount of money in crypto. Something I've been fascinated by is <laughs> what, how that's actually being used. I don't think there's been a lot of reporting into that yet. Um, especially in the case of these NFTs. Oh, uh, I, uh, but I, it's clearly... my, my, I, I looked into this. This is now many, many months ago, but a few months after, uh, there was a, a large portion of that money that was just sitting in their crypto wallet unused because yeah. they just, you know, they were getting, they were getting like, we, we heard all the, the numbers about the large amounts of crypto they raised and sure it was big amounts. And again, I have nothing wrong with that. If you people, that's the best use of crypto, uh, giving, giving it away. <laughs> um, but um, they raised, this didn't get as much press, but they obviously raised much more via fiat currency. And that's no doubt much easier to use. An interesting thing is that I just thought of now is to go back and see how much that crypto that they were holding is now worth. I'm assuming it's not worth as much as it was when they received it back in February and March. Yeah, it's interesting because they have such a savvy Ministry of Technology uh, who I feel like was able to leverage the press around that. And it's definitely an area that I'm hoping to do more reporting around because I don't think there's been a lot of follow up beyond those initial headlines of, you know, Ukraine is raising all this money in crypto about what that actually means. But these are always the questions when it comes to a new financial technology, which is on one hand, yes, it opens up new possibilities. Maybe in the case of Ukraine, it's easier for them to actually raise money quicker using crypto, but then how do you distribute it? What are all these logistical hurdles that come with it? Um, I think Coinbase found that out with Give Crypto, uh, and there's that's just one of the multitude of projects that are out there. Right, right. But then, you know, I guess the, the takeaway here is the reason why, like, first of all, the giving block sounds like a great idea if it is just like, you give crypto to them and they help, uh, you know, uh, exchange it for those charities, those, you know, established charities so they could, the actual charity never sees the crypto. Um, cause yeah, you know, there are people who have made tons of money in crypto out there, uh, those early speculators and such. And, uh, if they want to, uh, give it away without having to deal with exchange rates, uh, then, whatever as long as it's getting to the these you know organizations at the end of the day i'm i'm fully supportive of that um but yeah i guess you know at the end of the day it comes down to which of these crypto companies actually want to help and then which of them are just looking at it as a you know as a mechanism to promote crypto because if the uh, you know if those people aren't receiving the crypto, those people in need aren't receiving the crypto, and knowing that you know oh this this charitable contribution comes via the crypto world, then it's not you know it's not doing anything for them, so they might not be on board with even doing anything at all. Uh, that'll uh, that'll separate them, I guess, the ones who actually want to do something and those who just want to make money. Leo Schwartz of Fortune. Thank you so much for joining me. Great work on this piece. It was really fantastic. Um, I, I wasn't even that familiar with Give Crypto uh, and Coinbase's effort via that organization before this. 
And it was just an amazing look, uh, you know, as someone who already um, had experience, not good experience with uh, crypto related charitable efforts, but to know that it was true even for the biggest, the U.S.'s biggest exchange. And I do think Coinbase does still hold in most people's minds as the most like trustworthy of the big exchanges to see even they um, took part in this sort of thing. Um, I think was just like a, an amazing sort of thing to behold. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for the invite, Matt. I had a really good time. And where can people follow you online and where can they, uh, you know, any, any upcoming pieces you want to drop anything at all? Go ahead. Yeah. I'm on Twitter at Leo M Schwartz. I had a piece on Helium today, which you should check out. Everyone's favorite decentralized wireless company that Matt has done some fantastic reporting around. So hoping to do a lot more pieces on global impact of crypto, all the fun regulation that's coming out now, cybersecurity, the, the stories never stop. Damn, the, the dominoes keep falling for Helium, don't they? Yeah, I think they're having a tough time. <laughs> Have a great day, Leo. Take care. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks a lot. I think the overarching moral of this story is that uh, these mega corporations, whether they be crypto exchanges or fast food chains, have way too much money. And we should probably do something about that. But in terms of this specific space, I think the moral of the story is that A, crypto charities are promotional vehicles and B, even those with the best intentions in this space are at the end of the day still really trying to do A, hawk their crypto. Folks, patreon.com slash Matt Binder to support the show. Your monthly subscription helps this show grow. Also, you can support this show by going to youtube.com slash Matt Binder and subscribing to the channel. Catch the live premiere video version of every Scam Economy episode right there. And if you don't catch the live premiere, you can catch the replays. And you can leave a live chat in the live premiere, live streams, or you can leave a super thanks in the replay video comments, those are basically one-off payments, like a tip. You can also go to twitch.tv slash mattbinder and follow me there. On both YouTube and Twitch, I do a post-show live stream every week right after the show drops. And you can call in via Skype. And it's a lot of fun. We, we run the gamut of topics. And while you're at Twitch, be sure to connect your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. When you do so, Twitch gives you a free Twitch Prime subscription every month. What is that? It's a paid subscription to your favorite Twitch creator each month. Paid for the creator, as in they get paid by Twitch, but not paid for you because it's included already in your Amazon Prime subscription that you're paying. You might not know that. You might be letting Amazon slash Twitch keep extra money every month from your Amazon Prime subscription. Why would you let them do that? They have enough. Spread that wealth. Give your favorite Twitch creator that Twitch Prime subscription each month. I'm telling you about this in hopes that it's me, but just use it. Of course, follow me on Twitter at Matt Binder. Follow the show on Twitter at Scam Economy. Go to scameconomy.com for all of the links to the podcast version of the show. And also you can listen to the show right there at the site via your web browser if you prefer that. Leave a review at Apple Podcasts, at Spotify, wherever you listen to the show, whatever your favorite podcast platform may be, leave that review. It helps push the show up that platform's charts and helps people discover Scam Economy. Well, I think that about wraps it up this week. There is so much going on in the crypto space right now. Uh, I mean, for one, uh, Terra Luna founder Do Kwan uh, on the run, according to Interpol. And so much more, I, I mean, literally don't have the time to cover it in one episode each week. That's why you need to be sure to catch the next episode of the show when I see you all next time on The Scam Economy. Scam Economy.